Welcome back to the afternoon session of day two of the Open Web Forum at COGX, curated by Fabric Ventures. A quick reminder to check us out on Twitter at fabric underscore VC, where we are currently posting some pretty big announcements that you're not going to want to miss. So back to the show. Kicking off the second half of the day is Ilya Zinchenko, the co-founder of Entropy Network. He holds a PhD in theoretical physics and is an expert in NP-hard problems. Today, he'll be introducing the concept of no data ML and how it can get us to a scalable data network across organizations. Over to you, Ilya. Uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, yeah, so let me just kick off right on with the slides. Uh, so, yeah, so as Ian mentioned, I'll be uh, talking about the concept of no data ML and how this is. Uh, our, and I'll kind of outline the role to a scalable network across organizations. Uh, just a heads up, um, full transparency, the main point of this talk is hiring. And there's two main directions we're hiring for. So one is machine learning engineers and also backend engineers. Um, and so let's kind of take a step back and look at uh, just a human, right? Like any, any human really, right? So they kind of live in this world, they observe observe the world from various aspects and in response to different observations, right, that perform some actions, right? Now, these actions can be useful, not so useful, uh, but uh, but this is kind of the setup, right? And of course, uh, hopefully we also, uh, to choose which action to perform, right, we use some background knowledge or expertise and uh, hopefully some common sense, right? So. Now, of course, humans have their own flaws, right? They're they're slow, uh, you know. They're expensive, you know. Have hourly wage, uh, unreliable. Can get tired, need food, right? And uh, also a privacy risk, right? Uh, you never know who you can trust and what people can do with their information, right? Now, of course, um, part of the big purpose of this whole conference, right, is that um, there is this new player in town, which you know. Game, I guess in the last three or four decades, and that's machine learning models, right? And they can also observe the environment, right? They can look at pictures, they can look at time series data, text, various other forms of input, and also, uh, uh, um, like humans, they can choose which action or decision to make in 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 a situation which they see, right? And all you need to do is just to add some data, effectively, right? And and what's exciting about this, right, is that uh, it's way faster right, than, than a human. Uh, it's cheap, right? you can scale this up. Uh, reliable, um, normally every, every input which is the same returns the same output all the time. Uh, and uh, you can have algorithmic privacy, right? So you can, you can control how much information this model learns, what it uses this information for, and what, you know, and kind of what the consequences are. Right, um, and uh, also you can actually reach superhuman accuracy, right? So if, if you if you train on data without any or uh, too much uh, systematic noise, you can actually surpass the accuracy of humans, which also has been shown on many recent benchmarks in uh, in the scientific uh, literature, right? So uh, and of course uh, there is lots of applications for this, right? So there is uh, some obvious ones, right? Like self-driving cars. Uh, there's protein folding, there's huge uh, potential in, in, in healthcare, um, you can play games, right? Go, chess, uh, other things, StarCraft. Um, you can predict the markets, right? And you can also launch rockets into space and land them simultaneously, right? So, so there's, there's heaps of applications for this and, um, and lots of potential, right? Now, uh, if you look at kind of a model in the wild, right? Like in, in, in the industry, right? So, so a model is usually um, uh, doesn't really come naked, right? It's usually wrapped inside a product, right? Which which in turn serves uh, serves the customers of or users of um, of its creators, right? Uh, and uh, the model in turn is powered by some data, right? Now this is all good until we realize that to get access to this data, uh, we need the customers, and so we need um, the customers to get the data but then we need the data to get the customers. And so um, uh, unless we're you know, uh, doing some kind of scientific research with, with already pre-made open data sets, there is a little bit of a catch 22, right? So in the last, 
around what, nearly 20 years already, right? We've been having access to nearly infinite compute anywhere in the world at any time, right? In the form of cloud computing. And uh, we can also get any framework we want or any algorithm uh, we need uh, well, from GitHub and Stack Overflow, uh, like PyTorch and, 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 uh, and TensorFlow, right? But, but the third component we need, which is the data, is, is kind of, it, it, it is out there, right? It exists but there is no scalable access to the relevant data we need. Uh, and we're kind of on our own there. And so this data actually does exist across, right? And it's, it's spread around um, sometimes deep within the silos, right? Of uh, between different companies and institutions, organizations, sometimes within a company, right? There is various, uh, both privacy and encoding barriers to get access to this data, right? Um, and so, so it's, it's far from trivial uh, to actually tap into this resource. And, uh, but, right, uh, over the last maybe four or five years, there has been an immense uh, progress in the tooling uh, we need uh, to potentially actually make this happen, right? So, so there is, there's been lots of advancements in model architectures, right? Uh, there has been huge progress in privacy preserving tools, right? And, uh, and there's been lots of models which are uh, already pre trained. On, on heaps of data, which can be used as a as a starting point for more specialized models uh, after some fine tuning, right? And, and of course, a well known, um, maybe the most known of those is is the recent GPT three, which has actually already been surpassed by Voodoo in China, which which has another ten x the number of parameters of GPT three, right? There is something like uh, two trillion uh, uh, weights in Voodoo, um, and already in some preliminary benchmarks, it's shown. Even better performance than GPT-3 and all the all the all the standard benchmarks, um, and so all this progress has actually enabled, uh, you know, a large companies, small startups, and developers, right, to all get access to relevant data at scale for their models, uh, and kind of filling in this third component which was missing, right, to really reliably deploy a machine learning model in production, uh, and so uh, to potentially, of course, open this next paradigm on, or, or next generation of machine learning, right, there is, of course, some, some key challenges uh, we need to overcome, right? And uh, um, in this talk, I will, I will uh, outline uh, three of them, right? So one is privacy, and another one is uh, data encoding, right? Like, um, in what format do we store and transact this data in? And also uh, bootstrapping, right? Like, how do we actually bootstrap this data network, right? Because you can imagine, right, like, the value proposition for the first and second user of a network without any data is, is questionable. Right? So uh, let's first start with the data encoding, right? So, um, right, uh, and so, so humans, right? We normally converse in in natural language, right? This can be you know, any of the known languages in the world, right? Uh, and if we want to talk to a computer, right, we use a programming language, and computers talk to each other using data protocols, right? But, but what about data sets, right? Like how do data sets talk to each other, right? Like uh, can we actually figure out a common language between data sets to be able to uh, 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 find synergies and combinations between them, right? Uh, now an option uh, to, um, uh, to combine data sets, right, is, is of course to impose a fixed uh, global schema, right, which uh, the features of this uh, data need to comply, comply to. Right now, uh, such a schema is of course human verifiable. Right, you can you can name the different parts of the schema in a in a very human readable uh, fashion. Right, but the information density in such a schema is pretty low. Right, it only supports the features uh, it contains. Right, and also uh, mo maybe more importantly, right, uh, as the size of our network grows over time, it becomes brittle. Right, um, and um, right, right. Um, and what this really means, right, is that a schema which is which is great, which works great today, right, for the for the data we have today, uh, might be very very suboptimal, you know, uh, uh, for the data we'll have uh, um, a year from now, right? And 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 the more different parties and uh, different components there are in the network, the harder it is to change that schema, but the more data we have, right? So it's not a very viable solution at scale. At least. Another option is latent space, right? And that's effectively a uh, fine-tuned, optimized representation of the features, um, effectively an embedding, right? Uh, which can be mathematically specialized, 
for our specific use case. Right? Now, of course, this is effectively an optimal, mathematically optimal representation, and it has the highest uh, information density per feature. Right? But again, or um, uh, opposite right, to, the, to, uh, to the global schema, it's not human verifiable. It's not even human readable. Right? This is just vectors of numbers. And also, uh, it has, uh, also more importantly, a large barrier to exit. Right? So um, if you become dependent on a source of data which is encoded in a certain um, latent space, right, you can not verify it. You cannot modify it reliably, right? And if the source of this data suddenly disappears, right, maybe the, the company which supports it, you know, changes industry or dies, right, or gets acquired, then uh, anyone who is dependent on this source um, uh, has a huge risk associated uh, with it, right? Uh, a third option is to actually also use natural language uh, for data sets, right, is to encode data uh, in natural language. Now, this is a naturally portable, right? Uh, one, right, like by definition, in some sense, right? Um, uh, it's of course human verifiable, right? A human can can read this data and understand what's in it. Uh, but of course, there is some translation losses, right? So, if we take a data set and describe every single example in the data set in natural language, there is some loss of information. And similarly, when we map map it back, right? When we map uh, that language encoding back to whatever domain we want to use it in, there is another set of losses, right? Uh, and so, so if we look at these three different languages, right, if you will, uh, in which we can encode data, right? So, so here we have uh, uh, kind of a standard classic schema. Uh, it's a little bit portable, right? Of course, you can kind of enforce it for a small number of players, but as the number as the number of um, uh, kind of entities in your, in your network grows. Right, uh, this this becomes very brittle. Uh, the information density is decent, but again, right, if you want to support a, a wide range of data sets and information, uh, it's not very efficient. But uh, at the same time, it can be very human readable uh, and very fiable. Right. Now, a latent space is not portable at all. Right. Basically, anyone using it becomes completely locked in to the to the source of data. Right. Uh, the information density, however, is 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 really great. Right. It can be really optimized for a specific application. Uh, but again, the human readable um, aspect of it um, is non-existent, right? It's, it's just vectors of numbers, right? Um, uh, with natural language, however, right, it's, it's very portable, right? Like anyone uh, effectively who has uh, English um, data to English and English to data translator, right, uh, can use it. Uh, the information density is, is pretty good. It's, of course, worse than an optimized latent space, but it's usable. Uh, and the human readability is great, right? Uh, we can read and verify this information, right? And so, so this is actually the approach we are taking in 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 kind of the first data network we are building is to encode all the inputs to our model in natural language and also translate the outputs back to natural language when we when we return them, right? So uh, another um, another pillar, right, which we need to overcome or challenge, right, is the privacy part. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, so so let's uh, dive into that, right? Um, and again, let's just uh, take a step back, right, and see what is actually the goal here, right? So what we're what we want to do, right, is to is to train a model uh, on a lot of data, right? and what uh, effectively that implies, right? So let's say we just have a a bunch of data points in one dimension, right, and uh, you know we want to train a model and fit a function effectively, right, to this data set, right, which is in our case, just seven data points, right? There is an X value and a Y value, and we want to predict Y from X, right? So we, we fit this function F of X to be able to do that. And now um, let's imagine, right, that the specific values of X of our, uh, of our data set are sensitive, right? We do not want to reveal the values of our, um, of our data points at those specific values, right? Because, you know, they can, Maybe contain some personally identifiable information or or other uh, sensitive data, right? But in essence, right, this function f of x which we're fitting doesn't really mind about the specific values of x, right? All it cares about is the distribution of the data, right? And so effectively, we can fit the same function to a different set of points, which none of them uh, lie on the sensitive 
have the sensitive values of x, right? But they still correspond to the same function, right? Or even another set of points, right? Uh, which which can um, which 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 is again not sensitive, but uh, uh, to which we can fit the same function. And so uh, there is this is effectively the essence of privacy preserving machine learning is to give information about the distribution of the data rather than the actual raw data points themselves, right? And there's there's many techniques to do that, right? Like of course um, there is more than three which I will uh, show on the slide, but but those are the main ones, right? So one is SMPC or secure multi-party computation, right, is where effectively we split uh, um, at the model weights, right, into random parts, distribute those parts between between the, um, the different parties in our protocol, uh, and then do uh, uh, do do effectively computation on parts of the data, which we can uh, then recombine later on, right. Uh, there is also another approach uh, called homomorphic encryption, right, where uh, we we kind of translate all the data into an uh, encrypted space, and uh, then we can perform some computation in that space, and then decrypt the result again back. Uh, and then uh, there is maybe the most well-known approach, and that's differential privacy, right? And uh, it's kind of also maybe the most simple to understand, right? Is where you simply add some noise to the data itself or to the query you're performing um, uh, over the data, right? And so if we look at kind of the privacy level, which we need to obtain, right? Um, of course, no free lunch, right? Uh, it's not free, right? There is also resources, which, which we need to use uh, to get some privacy, right? And of course, there is model, model of performance, right? Of course, um, uh, the original information is always encoded in, in raw data. And even if we try to extract the distribution of, the data, of this data set, it, you know, want to try to add noise, all of that will, of course, negatively affect uh, the model performance, right? And so the cost of our privacy, right, the more privacy we want, normally the more resources we need, right? Like, for example, for SMPC, it's a very interactive protocol, and so we need uh, quite a large network overhead, right? Uh, for differential privacy, right, we're adding noise directly to the gradients of the model while training it, so it affects the model performance negatively, right? And homomorphic encryption can also require a lot of compute and memory to um, uh, to work, right? Um, but to give kind of very, very rough estimates, right, in terms of the resource overhead, um, it's around 10x, right? So, so uh, this is not, not a reliable, you know, kind of 10x in all cases, right? But very, very roughly, right? We need about 10x more resources, whether it's you know network overhead or compute or training time, uh, to reach a level of privacy which is kind of acceptable, right? Um, now, of course, if we want even more privacy, we need we need bigger overhead, right? But but this is the rough figure. But effectively, right? Like 10x, yes, it's more expensive, but it's within the uh, doable range. Um, uh, yeah, um, and 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 so. But what we also need to remember, right, is, you know, uh, just maybe a decade or, or 15 years ago, it was much more than that, right? It was more like 10,000 X, right? And so, so this is uh, just this last five years, um, uh, what progress in privacy preserving ML has achieved, right? And, and, and so, so currently we're, um, and, and yeah, by the way, so, so there's another aspect uh, to this, right? So, 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 so we're currently in 2021, Right, there's still, you know, if you want to transact any kind of uh, semi, even semi-sensitive data, right, in a commercial setting, right, you need to obtain a bunch of security certificates from these governing bodies, right? There's the ISO, SOC2, uh, PCI DSS. If you want uh, transaction transactions, financial transactions, right? There's GDPR in Europe, and ultimately, uh, kind of this algorithmic privacy, right, the holy grail of um, kind of algorithmic trust, right? Uh, which we need uh, to achieve real scale, uh, hopefully somewhere in this decade, right? So, and and the reason, right, is not even so much the algorithms or benchmarks or overhead, right? It's more the kind of standardization of these privacy approaches, right? And we really need, right, like um, like HTTPS, right, in, in secure in secure websites, right? We really need. Uh, an SSL level standardization for privacy preserving 
um, approaches in machine learning before before um, before algorithmic privacy can actually become com commercially viable, right? But uh, at the moment, um, legal privacy is still the only way um, to kind of achieve any form of uh, data transfer at scale in a commercial setting, right? And so now let's um, let's uh, let's talk about the last and maybe the most important aspect of the network, right? So having solved privacy and having figured out what um, kind of uh, data encoding we need, right, to store and transact uh, our data, uh, we still need to bootstrap this network, right? We need to convince the first, you know, uh, the first user, the second user, right, like the first 20 users uh, to use a data network, which, you know, they've never heard about, they have, you know, not used to this kind of approach, right, to, to just be able to tap into data, right? And so, so how do we do that? Right. So there is, of course, uh, many different aspects to it, and it's kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, it's really all about, right, like kind of maximizing the value for first users and really minimizing the barriers to entry, right? Minimizing the, um, um, yeah, kind of the cost and the risk of of using such a network, right? And so, uh, number one thing, of course, it needs to be useful even to the first user, right? Um, and that's that's in itself a challenge, right? Because a data network, right, is kind of by its nature an exchange of information between different players, right? So we need to be able to hack this and make this usable, you know, convince the first customer or the first user to join this network, right? Um, another kind of hack, right, let's say, right, is that we want to try to avoid this kind of two-sided marketplace, right, where we, we, we have different uh, people who are data consumers and data producers, right? And you kind of, you know, um, you, you, uh, the data producers kind of get paid for their data, and then the, their data kind of lives in some space, and then the data consumers come, and you need to convince them to use it, and then they pay the producers something, right? This is a very complicated system, right? But if we can figure out how we can uh, have both um, a user of the network to contribute the data while they're using it, then um, uh, that would be extremely powerful. Right. Uh, another thing, right, is of course a data network is not so much like you know just giving somebody a virtual machine and you know off they go, right? Which is right like Turing complete, right? Data is you know some data is relevant, other data is not relevant at all, right? But if we start this network just supporting a single kind of data, right, we kind of maximize the amount of uh, gain everyone else gets from uh, the data of, of 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 every single new customer, right? Um, Another part is kind of vendor lock-in, right? We want to avoid uh, any users in the network to kind of uh, lock themselves in immediately, right? I mean, right, if you're if you're like a large cloud provider, right, with already some pre-established trust that you're not gonna disappear, you know, in the next year, right? Like Amazon or, or Azure, right? Then, then of course, you can allow yourself and maybe you can even maximize the amount of lock-in people have, right? But But early on, you really need to minimize this to kind of uh, make the decision of any user uh, easy, right, to use the network. And so uh, kind of um, the breakdown of this, right, is if a company, right, ultimately, uh, you know, they have some problem they want to solve, right, and so they're looking for a product to solve this problem. And so immediately there is some probability, right, that they will choose one product and not another one, right? And uh, if this product, right, is powered by some machine learning model, there is another probability of which model do we need to use in a certain product, right? And the model itself is powered by some data from our network, and there is another probability here of which data our model will benefit from, right? So for a, for a user or a company or, or organization to, to kind of trace down all this path to use a certain data from a certain network, right? There's a lot, there's kind of a multiplicative, uh, like exponentially small probability Right, of making that decision, right? But if we can wrap our product or wrap, sorry, our, our data network or source of data into a product, right? Then this probability instead of this product just becomes, just becomes P1, right? It's just uh, um, kind of minimizes the decision barrier for somebody to, to kind of make that uh, conceptual leap of, uh, of using a, a certain kind of data. Right. And so all of these uh, kind of three pillars or three challenges, right, we are addressing in our first version of the data network, which has been live already for the last two months. 
And the only kind of data it currently supports is financial transactions. Uh, and it's, yeah, kind of, I want to say the first privacy preserving data network, right, for financial transactions in the industry. Uh, currently, it's, uh, it's only for US customers, uh, and, but will be expanding globally and also over time, uh, adding more and more uh, both features and also types of data we support. Uh, and yeah, so this can be accessed uh, over here if you're interested. Uh, but as I mentioned again, right, the main purpose of this talk is hiring uh, and it's to join. Uh, uh, we already have an epic team of engineers uh, you know, and creators right, and founders. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, right, we're, we're, uh, we're growing pretty fast and we're hiring both machine learning and backend engineers. And so if you're, you know, if, you're if you're excited by this mission and what uh, kind of um, um, a scalable data network uh, can do, um, then uh, yeah, please apply. And uh, it's jobs.entropy.network. Uh, thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Ilya, for that presentation. I've been trying to wrap my head around SMPC and book encryption, differential privacy for some time, and you managed to sit in 60 seconds, just describe them all and just flick a switch. So, so good. And then going on to explain, you know, from the ground up principles behind a cross organizational data network that can scale, which is, you know, just like a huge mission and, and explain from first principles that is, is amazing. So we're really glad of Fabric Ventures to be supporting you in this mission. So thank you so much. Next up, we have in about 30 minutes, uh, three, the Scaling Web 3 panel, where we're going to be discussing how can we actually you know, attract the next generation of builder without leaving you know, the millions of developers stuck in Web 2 behind. So you will really want to watch that one in 33 minutes. This is the uh, Open Web Forum at COGX, created by Fabric Ventures, and we'll see you soon.